My name is Gabriel Rosenfeld. Um, I'm the new president of the Center for Jewish History, and I'm very happy to begin this evening's event with a few words. Um, I am an actual academic historian by training and by profession, but my uh, research focuses on Jewish history in the European and especially the German context, so I'm not going to really be able <clears throat> to say anything authoritative about the history of the Civil War. <clears throat> but uh, that said, I do have a specialization in the field of counterfactual history, the history of what ifs, as some of you are probably aware, uh, which allows me to make one observation, at least by way of introduction, about this evening's topic. So it happens to be the case that one of the most popular themes in the entire field of counterfactual history is that of the South winning the Civil War. I just finished an essay actually on the subject and in doing my research, I came across a fascinating work that links the Civil War to Jewish history. In his pseudo documentary alternate history film from 2004, the African-American uh, director, Kevin Wilmot, and this is a film entitled CSA, The Confederate States of America, gives a pivotal role to the best known Jewish figure in the Confederacy, namely the Secretary of State and previous Secretary of War, Judah P. Benjamin. In the film, it is Benjamin who helps the South win the war by arranging a diplomatic alliance with Great Britain, which intervenes against the Union and contributes to the latter's eventual defeat. In the years that follow, the victorious Confederacy conquers Central and South America, extending slavery in the process and becoming a global power on the world stage. Unfortunately for the Jews, Southern power eventually ends up in tragedy because by the 19th century, at least by the end of the century, the Confederate government follows the logic of its racist principles by herding American Jews onto a reservation on, you guessed it, Long Island. And the Confederacy later allies with Nazi Germany in World War II, thereby becoming complicit in the crimes of the Holocaust. Now, tonight, I need not explain in further detail, we're not going to address the history of what might have happened, but the history of what did. And yet counterfactuals are an inherent part of historical analysis, whether in terms of causation or moral judgment. Um, and so it's always worth keeping these ideas in the backs of our minds. In any case, I'm extremely pleased to welcome Benjamin Chappelle and his colleagues from the Chappelle Foundation this evening, along with our distinguished panel of scholars, Deborah Dashmore, Adam Mendelson, and Jonathan Sarna, all of whom will be discussing the fascinating ways in which Jewish history and Civil War history intersect. At this point, I'd like to turn things over to my friend and colleague, the Center for Jewish History's Director of Programs, Dr. Miriam Mora, for further introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle, and hello to everyone here and watching this program online. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to work with the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation to bring this program to you tonight, and even more pleased to now have the opportunity to access the Chappelle roster as a researcher and historian of Jewish America who dabbles in military history. I wanna mention a quote that I think relates to this project and its significance. Myths die hard, and one of the hardiest is the canard that the Jew does not make a good soldier. This was written in the midst of the Second World War and published by the Jewish war veterans of the United States in a 1941 pamphlet called Jews in the World War, a study in patriotism and heroism. The purpose of this pamphlet was to dispel the, dispel the myth of Jewish evasion from military service. And such was the perceived urgency of that issue that they didn't even wait until the close of the war to publish evidence of active Jewish service. The same was true in 1919 before the close of the First World War when the American Jewish Committee's Office of Jewish War Records released a report on Jewish participation, quote, as an instrument wherewith to combat certain manifestations of anti-Jewish prejudice in the immediate present, again, referring to that old canard. Both of these examples were a continuation of the work that Simon Wolf began with his 1895 work on Jews in the Civil War, the American Jew as patriot, soldier, and citizen. Scholars of Jewish history have relied on this ambitious but limited resource for over a hundred years. And though it's been an invaluable part, it's been invaluable as part of the American Jewish story, the Chappelle roster picks up the work that Wolf began, which showed future organizations like the Jewish War Veterans and the American Jewish Committee that this needed to be done and recovers the evidence of those Jews in the Civil War for renewed and more accurate future research. I am so pleased to introduce Adrienne Diarmas, the director of the Chappelle roster. She joined the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation in 2011 bringing over 25 years of experience in primary source historical document research, 
data bait and digital asset management, and storytelling via exhi exhibitions, books, and websites to this new and exciting digital history resource. She has an MA in Museum Studies from George Washington University and a BA in Anthropology from Emory University. And her previous clients and employers include such institutions as the Smithsonian, uh, History of Historical Society of Washington, D.C., and Time Magazine. And now, Adrian Jaramus. Thank you, Miriam. That was that was lovely. Um, I and thank you to everybody who's here. I'm not going to lie. I'm really nervous. I can't believe we're we're here. That this is happening. This has been just a dream. So, forgive me if I read a little bit. Um, on behalf of the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation, I want to thank everyone at the Center for Jewish History for hosting this event, and all of you for attending, including the people on Zoom. Uh, thanks to Benjamin Chappelle's vision, Ariane Weissel Margalit's leadership, the Chappelle roster redefines how we look at Jews and the American Civil War. I also want to thank Adam Mendelson for an outstanding job of transforming the data we've been amassing uh, for more than a decade um, into such engaging and thought provoking prose. To my colleague, Sarah Willen, for her camaraderie her commitment to historical accuracy and passion for storytelling. Thea Wieseltier, uh, for her extraordinary ability to turn ideas into strategic partnerships. Whether it's finding the right publisher, in this case, NYU Press, or compelling the Jewish community, that's you guys, to take an interest in a niche project like the Chappelle roster. My colleague, Jamie Lavavi, who is the wizard behind the curtain that is Chappelle.org. For her attention to every detail, big and small, we wouldn't be here without her. To Jonathan Sarna and Deborah Dashmore for sharing their expertise and insight with us tonight. And lastly, I wanna thank my amazing, and I mean this, amazing team of roster researchers. Alexandra Apita, who is with us tonight. If you don't mind standing up, I would love everybody to say hi. Um, and Caitlin Winkler, Bonnie Zulo, and Janice Parente, who unfortunately weren't able to be with us uh, tonight, your dedication and your enthusiasm inspire me every day, and I mean that from the heart. Um, okay, and if I get choked up, yep, that's just what's happening. So anyway, here we go. Um, well, I guess I should have probably figured out how to do this. Oops. Um, oh, sorry, here we go, sorry. I was doing this backwards. Okay, I got you. Here we go. Okay, so who was Simon Wolf? What do you need to know about him? And why are we reappraising his magnus opus? Magnum opus, excuse me. Briefly, Simon Wolf was a Bavarian-born immigrant who became a Washington, D.C.-based social justice warrior. He advised multiple US presidents on Jewish related topics and his legacy, a book entitled The American Jew as Patriot, Soldier and Citizen was created in response to anti-Semitic rhetoric about Jewish patriotism or the perceived lack thereof. Published in 1895, it included more than 8,000 names of soldiers and sailors who served in the American Civil War. As you can see, it was predominantly a somewhat alphabetical list of names and regiments with the occasional detail, such as Victor Purley, 7th Infantry, quote, killed at Chancellorsville, end quote. For Ben Chappelle and other collectors with an interest in both the Civil War and American Jewish history, it was an invaluable resource, but it wasn't very user-friendly. It wasn't 100% reliable. And so the idea of what would become the Chappelle roster was born. When I first started on this project more than a, excuse me, more than a decade ago, the assignment was to confirm military service for the names in Wolf's book and add any that he overlooked. Scholars believed that if any of the names in his book were not Jewish, the number was so insignificant as to not be worth our time and effort. The first seed of doubt about this assumption was planted by a Massachusetts soldier named Henry Marks, who was brought up on charges for stealing a ham for his personal use. 
Uh, the next clue came from an obituary for the mother of a Pennsylvania soldier named Philip Halpin. It stated that she'd, quote, lived a true Christian life, end quote, and so on and so on. As of today, our research has determined that 10% of the names in Simon Wolf's book are definitively not Jewish. So not so insignificant after all. This is not surprising, however, given that name profiling was considered a sound and respectable research methodology at that time. Nevertheless, if we were to create a solid foundation for the future study of American Jewish history, Wolf's 19th century work needed a 21st century upgrade. How do we do what we do? The answer, carefully and collaboratively. We have two mandates. We have to obtain proof of military service and evidence that a soldier was Jewish. Service is usually pretty straightforward, uh, but proving that someone who lived more than 150 years ago uh, was Jewish is a little bit trickier, as you might imagine. Whereas not all resources are equally reliable, we look for evidence of religion in cemeteries, newspapers, archives, genealogical websites, and even military records. One of our best resources is descendants. So if you or someone you know has an, has an ancestor who is in America circa 1860, we really hope to hear from you. If they served, we want to put them in the roster. <clears throat> in addition to vetting the names from Wolf, we add names he omitted. To date, we've added nearly 1,500, 88 of which were added last year. And last month, Alex added 14, almost all of whom were sent to us by descendants. Now, while I'm talking about numbers, allow me to address the most often asked question we receive, how many Jews served in the Civil War? The reality is that answer changes every single day. Um, just last week, I confirmed that M and D. Barwald from Wolf's list were Jewish brothers, Morris and David, and that Morris served under the name of Barwood, and that the records for David's regiment did not survive the war. Between new additions and finding new evidence that a name from Wolf was Jewish, the Chappelle roster is constantly being updated. More importantly, Numbers tell us nothing about these men. Remember how Wolf listed Victor Purley killed in Cham at Chancellorsville? Here's what the Chappelle roster has for Victor Purley. Affidavits from his mother, a photo and more background information from his cousin, a family tree and the register of his birth from a synagogue in Hungary. Isn't that weird? That's okay. Um, from a synagogue in Hungary, courtesy of a descendant I met on Ancestry last week. The descendant didn't know that Victor had immigrated to America and died at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And we didn't know much about his life in Hungary. So it was a very fruitful collaboration for both of us. Much more than a military roll of honor, the Chappelle roster soldier pages contain the carefully collected details of their lives and our favorite feature, the connection between them. Whether they married a fellow soldier's sister, maintained a lifelong friendship with someone they once shared a tent with, or served with their brothers, fathers, and cousins. After a decade of being immersed in their lives, I can tell you that not every one of them left footprints in the historical record, but when they did, <clears throat> we found them to be brave heroes and cowardly deserters. <laughs> pillars of the community, and criminals. Uh, while some died much too young, many others were celebrated centenarians. Getting to know each and every one of them has been a privilege and a pleasure, as has being here with you tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce Jonathan Sarna, who is a university professor and the Joseph H. and Bell R. Brown Professor of American Jewish History at Brandeis University, where he directs its Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. 
He is also the past president of the Association for Jewish Studies and chief historian of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, author and editor of more than 30 books on American Jewish history and life. His book, American Judaism, A History, recently published in its second edition, won six awards, including the 2004 Everett Jewish Book of the Year Award from the Jewish Book Council. He's a fellow of the American Academy of the Arts and Sciences and of the American Academy of Jewish Research. His most recent books are When General Grant Expelled the Jews, Lincoln and the Jews, A History, published with Benjamin Chappelle, an edition of Cosella Wayne by Cora Wilburn, the first and hitherto unknown American Jewish novel, and Coming to Terms with America, a volume of essays. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Sarnoff. Well, thank you, and what a pleasure to be back here at the Center for Jewish History. Um, now, uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating everyone involved in bringing this amazing book and roster uh, into existence. I especially want to uh, congratulate Adam on what you will see is uh, a book that in many ways changes our understanding of Jews in the Civil War. Um, and I want to uh, I congratulate all involved in creating the roster. One of the great things about a database is that it can be used in many ways and indeed for purposes that cannot even be dreamed of sometimes by the creators of the database. Uh, a student of mine who uh, wrote a PhD named uh, Dr. Benjamin Steiner got advanced use of the database and he, he wrote his doctorate on Ktubot, on uh, Jewish marriage contracts. And it turned out that the database is probably the largest single collection of mid 19th century Jewish marriage contracts in America. Um, what I want to do, however, uh, this evening in just a brief uh, time available is really to show how through the use of both the New Chapelle roster and the manuscripts of the Chapelle manuscript collection, and also some genealogy. I know that uh, the head of Jewish Gen is with us this evening. If you put all those things together, you can find out things that were never previously known and that could not have been known uh, by having them, uh, uh, by only using them separately. I want to start here. Um, with um, uh, one of the greatest treasures of the Chappelle uh, Manuscript Foundation. It's a letter, as you can see, from Abraham Lincoln. And it says, Sir, I believe we have not yet appointed a Hebrew. This may be the first case of affirmative action in all of American history. Yeah. A Sheree M. Levy is well vouched as a capable and faithful man. Keep that word faithful in mind. Lincoln is full of wordplay. When you read a brief Lincoln letter, there are layers. And that word faithful turns out to be full of layers. Let, uh, and, and Lincoln concludes, let him be appointed um, an assistant quartermaster with the rank of captain. Now, uh, we wrote about that letter uh, in the book Lincoln and the Jews, but we didn't know uh, then what uh, we can reveal now about uh, this Sheree M. Levin. Here he is. Uh, this is uh, where he's buried. Uh, first of all, you may be surprised at the name Sheree. It, it indicates 
French or Montchery, and uh, that's the name. Uh, and uh, and take a look at that uh, middle name of his, Moisa. Some folks who know American Jewish history will see a bell going off. I will get to it in a minute. We know a lot about the Moisa family, which is one of the greatest families of the Confederacy. And indeed, he is born in Charleston. Now, uh, what's interesting about Cherie M. Levy is that he was an open, indeed an Orthodox Jew. He was the son-in-law of a character we know from uh, the Civil War uh, era, uh, whose name was uh, Rabbi Morris Rafal. But what we didn't, and indeed, if you go back to your copy of Lincoln and the Jews, we write about it, Rafal supported him. Rabbi Rafal uh, is uh, famous uh, for a sermon he delivered on slavery uh, 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 legitimated in the Bible. But actually, once the war began, uh, he supported uh, uh, the Union. Uh, uh, Adam, in his book, reveals that he kind of went back and forth. Um, but what's interesting is that taught us the first meaning of faithful. He really was a faithful man. He worshipped every day. He was involved in Jewish life not like some of the others. Now, seeing that middle name, we know that Lincoln's sense of faithful also had a second meaning because we had no reason to believe that a Moisa would be faithful to the Union. The man you're looking at now is Abraham, Moisa, and Abraham Moisa was the first member of this very important family to come from uh, Haiti. Following the slave revolt, he escaped reputedly just with the clothes on his back. And indeed, here's what we know about Abraham Moisa. He's originally from Alsace, hence the Muncherie, the French name, and the Moisa. Um, he goes to St. Eustatia, uh, which had once a Jewish community. Uh, they backed uh, the American Revolution, and the British punished them, and it never survived. Uh, that was the end of the St. Eustatia, so it became uh, uh, a... Um, after taking a trophy wife, 26 years his junior, he, um, he went uh, and set up a plantation in Santo Domingo um, uh, 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 on the island of Hispaniola. And, I, and then there was a slave revolt and they fled to Charleston. As an aside, I don't know if anybody here remembers the story of the slave revolt in Haiti, but if you do, there is a famous character in the slave revolt in Haiti named General Moisa. And General Moisa, who's African-American, was reputedly a slave originally on the Moisa plantation. The, word, the name Moisa is still known among African-Americans uh, in Haiti. In any case, um, uh, 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 Abraham Moisa, uh, who had been the owner of the plantation, loses everything. And as you will see, they never regain their prosperity. And that's important because we can now understand why the Moises were such great supporters of slavery in the South why they were petrified at the idea of the slaves going free, having experienced what they did in Haiti. And indeed, when we look at the Moises, 
uh, an enormously important family. You see names uh, of famous Moises, uh, Penina Moisa, the well-known poet. Uh, um, some of her hymns are still in reform volumes of, um, uh, of poetry and, um, she, uh, and hymns, and she's a staunch supporter of the Confederacy. Chaim Moiza, uh, his son became Speaker of the House, the kind of Nancy Pelosi of Louisiana. Uh, little known fact, uh, when you look at Louisiana, there were three Jews, really, who uh, were important there. One was uh, uh, was uh, Chaim's son. Another was a Judah Benjamin, whom we've already heard. And then there was Henry Hyams. Every one of them intermarried. Uh, but Jews were important in Louisiana, especially uh, because New Orleans. Uh, Abraham Moisa, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, they, they were Confederates, two of his kids. And so it goes until we get down all the way. Uh, where's Cherie? Uh, oh, there he is, 1781. Uh, there is Cherie, um, uh, sometimes spelled differently, uh, born in 1781. He doesn't live too long. When you see people who died um, about when he died, you wonder, was it yellow fever? But he lived long enough to marry. He marries um, uh, into a very significant Charleston family, the Moses family. And they had a daughter named Rachel. And Rachel marries Elias, uh, born in England. And our Cherie Moisa Levy was uh, there, uh, was their son. And he marries uh, Esther Caroline, the daughter of this man, uh, the Reverend um, Morris J. Raphael. We know a lot about Rabbi Raphael. That's his famous or infamous uh, sermon. And uh, very recently, um, they discovered where he was buried. Like a lot of Jewish graves, uh, it, it, it has been lost over time. And now an organization um, has rediscovered it. And there it is. And, um, uh, well, let me uh, go there. Yes. Um, uh, Rabbi Raphael uh, had uh, a son who was seriously wounded. He lost an arm in the Civil War. His name was Alfred. And, um, and uh, as I say, his daughter married our friend, Cherie Levy, whom Abraham Lincoln appointed a quartermaster. Interestingly, Sharivi had a younger brother. His name was Clarence. He fought for the Confederacy. And so we now know another example of two brothers on opposite sides of the Civil War. How many believe, oh, it's only in World War I the Jews fought Jews. Actually, in the Civil War, Jews for Jews, and this is a little known example. There are some well known examples, uh, like the Jonases, that had uh, 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 Jews on both, on both sides. Um, now, um, uh, uh, what, what you can see uh, here uh, are uh, also brothers in law. Uh, who were both soldiers. It was not uncommon. And our friend Adam did a study uh, showing um, uh, that um, uh, there, were, um, uh, there were several uh, brothers-in-law. It was not, um, not rare. Um, uh, and he has a whole uh, collection of Jewish brother-in-laws, meaning you could lose your whole family in uh, in in the Civil uh, War. Um, now, um, and my time, uh, uh, exciting as it is to talk about this, uh, is running out. But let me just um, 
uh, 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 show you here a couple of other things. This is a letter from Rabbi Rafal to Abraham Lincoln, thanking him. And we understand why he thanked him because Sheree Levy got into trouble. Um, he got into trouble because he uh, had a soldier under him who was alcoholic and he decided to withhold some of that soldier's pay, apparently after consultation, because he didn't want all the money to be spent on alcohol. However, the soldier said, you're stealing my money. Uh, Abraham uh, Lincoln initially accepted the soldier's word and, and uh, indeed poor Cherie was um, uh, cashiered out of the military um, uh, forever for stealing money from a soldier. Later, apparently, Lincoln uh, decided that maybe there was more to Cherie's um, uh, uh, decision than he had initially um, uh, wrote about it. He reconsidered uh, and uh, he renominated Levy as assistant quartermaster. He did that in late January. Apparently, this letter was a letter of, uh, of thanks. Um, my whole family unites with me in feeling that you are indeed his true benefactor. Um, he didn't mention some of the sermons that, um, uh, that Adam quotes in his book, uh, Rabbi Raphael's Congregation was not very supportive of, um, uh, uh, of the Civil War and the Union effort. Um, the, the point and the conclusion from all of this is that the Chappelle roster really um, allows us and, and gives us a wondrous new tool for investigating the large story of Jews who fought in the Civil War, it has to be used in conjunction with other sources, many of them available on the website of the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation, and also in conjunction with the books now, uh, with this book published by the Chappelle Manuscript Foundation, and together they can shed ongoing new light on the Civil War experience of America's Jews. Yasha Koach, congratulations all around. Thank you so much, Professor Sarna. I'm going to introduce now uh, Deborah Dash Moore and Adam Mendelson. Um, Adam Mendelson is the director of the Kaplan Center for Jewish Studies and associate professor of history at the University of Cape Town. He's the author of The Rag Race, How Jews Sewed Their Way to Success in America and the British Empire, and co-editor of Jews in the C and the Civil War, a reader with Dr. Jonathan Sarna. Transnational Traditions, New Perspectives on American Jewish History with Ava Khan, and Yearning to Be Breathe Free, Jews in the Gilded Age America with Jonathan Sarna. He's co-editor of the journal Jewish Historical Studies and previously co-edited the, co the journal American Jewish History. Deborah Dashmore is the Frederick G. L. Heathwell Professor of History and Professor of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. She also serves as editor-in-chief of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization and has authored many books, including At Home in America, G.I. Jews, How, the World, How World War II Changed a Generation, and To the Golden Cities. And most recently, she's explored the formative encounter of Jews in American cities in Urban Origins of American Judaism and written a comprehensive history of New York Jews, Jewish New York, The Remarkable Story of a People and a City. And her forthcoming book, Walkers in the City, Jewish Street Photographers of Mid-Century New York, extends her interests in urban Jewish history to photography. Please join me in welcoming Professors Mendelssohn and Verdash Moore. So 
we've heard various things about the Civil War, um, about Simon Wolf and about how the, the Pell roster got started. Um, why did you write the book, and how does this book relate to sort of the history of Jews in the Civil War, specifically in the uh, in the Union? So, so, so as um, uh, the two previous speakers, speakers have described, th there is a literature uh, which dates back to the 1890s, looking at, at, at Jews and the war. But the scholarly literature, the, the academic literature on, on uh, Jews in the war, really almost begins and ends with a very important book which was published in the, in the 1950s, a book by, by Burke and Horn on, on the Jews in the, in the American Civil War. But what it's, it's a wonderful book and still very, very valuable for a whole variety of reasons. But what that book doesn't do, the, the, the surprising gap is to talk about Jewish soldiers. But they, they appear in the volume, but, but much of it is actually about the Jews in the home front, but the, the variety of, of challenges uh, that, that Jews encounter, uh, and a, a variety of anti-Semitic episodes during the war, uh, and, and other moments where the war really matters for American Jewry. But, there's this interesting lacuna, this interesting gap in the literature doesn't really address what is it like to be a Jew in the Union Army. And, and, and this is what this book tries to do, try to understand what, is the, what are the day-to-day -day challenges uh, which, which Jews encounter. My book also builds on, on a growing literature on uh, Jews and the military and Jews and, and these moments, particularly during wartime, where uh, which pose fundamental questions to Jews and their relationship with the state. So, so your own book, uh, for example, but, you know, talks about the First World War as, as well, and trying to understand exactly this. So what is the experience of Jews often, in many cases, certainly during the, the Civil War, but also during uh, the First World War and uh, the Second World War as well, of, of new Americans, people who, who either the children of immigrants or immigrants themselves, what is it like to, uh, to, to, to serve alongside others uh, to at a moment of, of obviously great uh, danger in a variety of ways, but also great tension in society. So these moments, which the Civil War is, is clearly an example of, where, uh, where so much is disordered, is upended, and, and, which, and it provides opportunities and challenges for Jews. So, so studying the war, studying Jews in the Civil War, allows us to see this particular moment of crisis and how Jews respond to it. So, to study these Jewish soldiers, of course, and their experiences, you have to begin with whether they decide to enlist and why they might decide to enlist. Um, and that's not necessarily an easy decision um, because, okay, there does come to be a draft, right? But you can buy your way out of the draft in those years. So tell us a little bit about how you teased out some of the motivations. Why did people, why did these Jewish men decide to enlist in the Union? So it's a very good and complicated uh, question. Uh, that, so why do, 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 in many cases, immigrants, not all immigrants, but, but the majority of Jews who, who do serve are born abroad uh, and they've been in America for, uh, in, in many cases, for a decade or less. Uh, they are, uh, in many cases, economic migrants, people who come as young men and trying to establish themselves, they have started in most cases businesses, and and why would they then uh, disrupt everything, uh, um, potentially forsake a, a hard won a business they've created to 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 enlist with all the dangers and uncertainties of enlistment, and the truth is that, that in many cases Jewish men decide not to enlist. Uh, that and it's to me is it's a, it's a rational decision. Um, that, that the risks are, are, are too great um, and the rewards are uncertain, particularly later in the war, once uh, th th there's a wave of, of enthusiasm, particularly in, in, the, in the spring of 1861. So we see most Jewish soldiers who enlist, enlist then, in, in this, you know, this burst of, of, of patriotic enthusiasm. But later in the war, once it becomes apparent what the costs of the war will be and that this is not going to be a a, an easily won or, or cheaply uh, won war, we see uncertainty and we see uh, a number of, of, uh, of people who, who, who you know, we think might have, uh, uh, you know, certainly are patriotic and certainly support the war effort in many cases, but there is uncertainty, diffidence, ambivalence about, about uh, um, serving. And we see, and this is not just distinct to Jews either, that, that this is a pattern amongst many other ethnic and immigrant groups, that there's 
uh, that, that particular sense uh, that, uh, and, and it's true of Jews and true, true of, of Irish and Germans as well, that the war also brings this tide of, of rejection as well, particularly for Jews in the early months of the war. There's a, a burst of anti-Semitism, which we can, we can talk about. I can show you some images related to this, which, which connected with the war. Uh, where and, and you can imagine a, a Jew on the home front who's asking himself and speaking to his, his family uh, potentially about the war that why would I serve when I'm, I'm facing this, this wave of rejection? I've been told that, I'm, that, that I, I can never be a, a true citizen, that we are, we are Jews, we are only, in for, you know, uh, only interested in profit as opposed to, um, to, to patriotism. So, so there certainly are, you know, the Jews have reason for, for, for diffidence and, and there are moments in the war again, later in the war, where, where that anti-Semitism surfaces in, in dramatic and very public ways. And again, this must play on the minds of those on the home front. But in, certainly plenty of Jews do enlist, and they enlist for the, in some cases, for the same reasons as, as everyone else, that, you know, as I've described, certainly that, that in, initially in 1861, that tremendous sense of, of uh, devotion, this desire to protect the union, this sense of idealism, you know, Jewish, uh, particularly uh, some uh, soldiers who, who bring an ideological baggage with them from, from Central Europe, that some have been involved in the revolutions of, failed revolutions of 1848, and they're really driven by a sense that the American Republic can, must survive um, and, and that they are you know, dedicated to the cause. And there, there are others who, who enlist for more day-to-day -day reasons, that, that their wartime disrupts economic activity, that if you're a peddler, in the countryside, as many Jewish men are, uh, that uh, you need to earn a living and suddenly the market is, has dried up. What are we going to do? And the, a military salary, the promise of a paycheck seems, seems attractive. And then likewise, those, these varied motivations interact. So, so, so we have plenty of cases where the people are driven by patriotic intent, but, but likewise, the, the promise of material rewards uh, matter too, that, that you know, Jews behave in very, very human ways, obviously, to, to to, to war time. So once they get in, right, to military service, um, they also have an experience as a minority for most, most cases, although you do highlight a couple of uh, units that were um, recruited among Jews themselves. So could you talk a little bit about that uh, experience, unless you wanted to sure. say something about this wonderful flag? Thing. Actually, this, this provides a, you know, a good connection with your, with your, your, your question. Um, so this flag here behind me is the flag of the 149th um, New York Volunteer Infantry, a, a regiment raised uh, in, in August and September of 1862. Uh, so this is it's raised after um, major Union losses uh, on, the, on, on the battlefields of 1862, after the summer of, of 1862. Um, and it's uh, raised in Syracuse, New York, this, this particular uh, regiment. Um, and what's wonderful about this flag, as you can see behind me, that this flag is donated to regimental flag. It's one of the two flags that the regiment will fly on, on the battlefield. And, and the flag is very important on the battlefield as a as a marker of, of, of the, the unit and, and, and its advance or retreat or movement. And, and, and this is a flag which is dedicated, paid for by the Jewish ladies of, of Syracuse. Likewise, we know that the, the rabbi of the synagogue in, in, uh, in Syracuse is uh, likewise um, involved in, in recruiting, that the synagogue is one of the, the sites where uh, speeches are given, money is raised for, uh, for this particular uh, regiment. And this regiment, one of its companies, uh, has a, a considerable number of Jews in it. There's 20 Jews, I think it's in Company um, C of this, of, of, of this regiment, and has Jewish officers in uh, the, this company uh, as well. And it's often assumed, incorrectly in fact, assumed that this is a, a Jewish, because of this flag, that this is a, a Jewish regiment. This regiment is, is unusual in how many Jews serve within it. So, so um, to have 20 uh, Jews in a company, company typically would be 100 men, uh, this is unusually high. That in fact, more typically, uh, because of the dispersion of Jews in the United States uh, for a whole variety of reasons uh, prior to the Civil War, that the fact that Jews are peddlers and shopkeepers in small towns and scattered across the countryside, that it's very unusual for, for Jews to, to, be, to serve 
uh, in significant numbers in any in any one regiment. That that instead, um, again, drawing on data from the Chappelle roster, we know that that you serve in at least 293 regiments. A regiment is typically around a thousand men, and so 293, at least 293 regiments, and only 25 regiments of those 293, only 25 of them um, have 10 or more Jews in. So more typically, Jews are serving amongst uh, uh, one or two other, other Jewish soldiers. So the experience is, this is an atypical experience, instead far more common to be to serve in this isolated fashion, that, that maybe you are fortunate enough to have one or two other Jews within your company, or maybe even within your regiment. And this really shapes then the, the experience of, of Jews in, in the army, that sense of, of isolation, that, um, that that's, uh, um, to be a, a Jew alone or a Jew uh, with very few other Jews around you means that the Jewish experience is different from that, for example, of other ethnic groups, other immigrant groups in America at the time, that it's far more common, for example, for Germans or the Irish or Scandinavians to, to serve in genuine ethnic regiments that, that where the majority of soldiers are come from the same background. Instead, Jews, they might serve alongside other Germans, but that they're um, more typically uh, on their own or amongst very few others. And this has implications for worship. It has implications in terms of encountering prejudice, implications for a sense of solidarity and community for Jews in the army as well. So you have another um, image? Absolutely. Yeah. So this also speaks to your, to your point. Uh, this is a regiment behind us over here, uh, the Cameron Dragoons. This is the, the 5th Pennsylvania Cavalry, an interesting case, uh, you know, much written about uh, this, this particular uh, regiment and this particular uh, colonel. It's a regiment raised, as you can see, by Colonel Max uh, Friedman, who, who is a, who's, who's Jewish. It's one of, of two uh, regiments in Pennsylvania which, which, are, which are raised by, uh, by, by Jewish officers. And um, it's, uh, you can see the, the regiment's encampment behind on, on, the, on the other side. Again, a very rare wartime photograph of, of the Cameron Dragoons in, in, in camp. And um, uh, what's interesting here is that uh, Max Friedman, perhaps unsurprisingly, so this is fairly typical of uh, regiments at the time, that, that because he, he has a pre-war militia experience, that he uh, serves in the Pennsylvania militia, and he raises a regiment at the beginning, early on in, in the war, and he surrounds himself by uh, surrounds himself with family members and with with other Jews as well. This is the regiment where which, which uh, enlists very an, an unusual example, which uh, selects as its chaplain a a, a, a Jewish man. And there's a whole uh, and again uh, this this creates then then you know, crisis trouble uh, in the early stages of the war, uh, given that the Chaplaincy Act uh, demands that a chaplain be of a Christian denomination. Uh, so, so it's an interesting case. What's fascinating to me about uh, Max uh, Friedman is that he has this pre-war military experience and, and he has this senior rank uh, colonel commanding uh, the, this regiment. But it, as seems to be fairly typical of a, a number of these, of, of individuals with seeming pre-war uh, military experience, we have some Jews from, from Central Europe who, who bring with, you know, with them uh, real or uh, pretend claimed a military experience as well, that these officers have less than distinguished records. And we, we see instead interesting examples of, of those who, who begin more humbly, uh, who, who rise uh, uh, into positions of authority. So, so Max Friedman doesn't last very long. He, he's uh, ultimately, he, he leaves his regiment for reasons I think uh, connect, connected with, with disgrace. Um, but, um, and in fact, the, the next slide is of precisely this as well. This is um, the, uh, the Yukasi brothers. Again, um, I'm, I'm, you know, these are these are disreputable Jewish soldiers. They're plentifully, plentifully of, of reputable Jewish soldiers in, in the book. But, but again, someone, you know, a, 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 someone who, who raises a regiment uh, during the war, uh, less successful, again, uh, and has trouble with the law, uh, has invents a whole past history for himself, a wonderfully you know, creative uh, uh, imagination in terms of his past record, claims to be a, a Hungarian aristocrat and to be a dancing master and uh, a, 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 um, to have a, a fine record in um, a military record in Europe and turns out to be a Jewish horse dealer 
uh, who, who has invented this whole past for himself. But again, you know, he too has this undistinguished war record. He's much written about because of his, his lies and self uh, presentation is so grand. But in fact, these are, uh, you know, his regiment or his uh, uh, leadership in this regiment is relatively short lived. We see many more interesting examples of Jews who, who as I've described earlier, rise from humble beginnings and, and prove themselves uh, as, as officers in the army. So these atypical figures, right, um, are intrigued by the possibilities of leadership, right, um, and clearly also have sufficient command of English that they are able to do this kind of recruiting uh, of their fellow, um, fellow soldiers and, and fellow, fellow Americans. Um, you, you've indicated that most Jews experience military service in the Union Army as individuals, essentially, uh, which makes it really hard to, uh, to be Jewish, right? Because being Jewish usually involves other people, um, and it, it involves, therefore, an internalization of being Jewish. You also mentioned, however, that there was anti-Semitism. Um, and maybe you want to say a little bit about that piece of the, of the story, uh, not just the sort of the, the famous big anti-Semitism, you know, that uh, Professor Sarna has written about so well uh, in terms of, of General Grant, but more the, the, the more intimate encounters or the more popular stuff that's around. Absolutely. So, so uh, I mean, as I was describing uh, earlier, um, one of the phenomena we see early on in the, in the war are these claims that that Jews prefer profit to, to, to patriotism. And this cartoon behind us describes exactly that. You can, you can see um, um, in a, this is an encapsulation of, of, of that theme. So we certainly have that undercurrent and certainly on the, on the home front, um, particularly during the first year of the war, uh, this messaging, which, is, uh, which, which contains elements host, hostile to the Jews. Likewise, this idea that that Jews are, are, are profiting from the war as, as military contractors and again are preferring uh, profit over, over patriotism. So, so, so that is, is you know, that's certainly a message on the home front. This is likewise what, what Jews are seeing, Jewish soldiers are seeing in, in newspapers as well. What about the, the, the more day-to-day -day encounters? What is it like to, to, for, for a Jew to, to serve in, in this isolated fashion often among strangers? And we see a variety of experiences. Um, certainly, there are these heartbreaking accounts um, of, of, of various kinds, which, which appear in, in the book. Uh, the, the letters, for example, of uh, um, Joseph A. Joel, uh, who, who um, a, is a fascinating uh, figure, someone who's, a, again, an immigrant, in his case, from England, uh, who has the misfortune of enlisting in a regiment where, where he is, again, the only Jewish soldier in, in his company. And he's tormented, as, as his letters uh, reveal. Um, he, he writes to Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, who, who is his um, uh, lieutenant colonel. Um, and he writes after the war extensively about what his experience. And he describes in these very graphic terms the torments that he encounters, that, that he's surrounded, he blames of excess that he's in a, in a company where he's surrounded by Catholic soldiers and that they might make his life hell. Uh, they um, swap his uh, sugar for, for, for salt. So, so he's, um, they trip him up. Uh, they torment him with, uh, you know, uh, it, it by, by um, shouting at him, by swearing at him. And uh, he, after the war, credits uh, Rutherford B. Hayes for having moved him from, from his, that particular company to, to another company to escape these, these daily torments. And, and this creates a very lifelong connection between the, the, two, uh, the two men. So we have examples like that and other examples, Max Glass, a, a again, tragic figure, someone who's somewhat conned into military service. He has his uh, enlistment bonus uh, stolen uh, from him. And uh, again, is tormented by, by the soldiers within his regiment who, who throw mud at him. They call him Christ killer. Uh, there is physical abuse, which he describes uh, as well. And what's interesting about his case is that 
he, he ultimately, he actually deserts or attempts to desert, he attempts to escape his, his, his regiment. He, he tries to enlist in the Navy, he's caught, he's sentenced or he's, he's imprisoned. And then he has an unlikely savior. He writes a, a, a letter in his very broken English uh, to Benjamin Butler, uh, who's a, a figure we know uh, in a different context for his quite notorious anti Semitic uh, um, ideas about Jews. And Butler takes sympathy on him and, and essentially um, uh, um, allows him to return to his regiment, which I suppose might be punishment in itself. So, so we have you know, examples of, of that kind, but also plenty of examples of the opposite, where I think that this proximity that Jews have with strangers, uh, where I think initially their Jewishness is something exotic, something unknown, something unfamiliar, uh, is broken down by, by proximity and by day-to-day -day encounters that you eating with your fellow soldiers constantly, you are marching side by side, you're mutually dependent, uh, you are uh, literally you know, fighting sh soldier, uh, shoulder to shoulder with them, and, and uh, they, they are entrusting you with, uh, with their lives and, and vice versa. So we see, I think, this normalization for, for, for many Jews as well, uh, that, 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 that exoticism disappears uh, at, um, during the military, their military experience. And we also have the opposite. We have examples of philo-Semitism. There's a wonderful case I, I came across of a Jewish soldier being you know, pulled from the ranks by an officer who's just delighted, excited to meet a Jew, uh, sort of this, this biblical creature in the, in the Union Army. And, and um, so, so, so that as well, that, that's, I think that, that sense of, of familiarity, which, which um, this intense experience uh, creates uh, during, during the Civil War. So just to remind people that Rutherford B. Hayes eventually went on to become a president, right? Um, and that was a, a, a friendship that, that lasted then. And J.A. Joel writes this wonderful account of a Passover Seder that he celebrates in the wilds of Kentucky, I believe it is, um, or maybe it's West Virginia, uh, where he manages to find another Couple of couple of guys, and they they get matzah from Cincinnati from the suckler, and uh, it's I know it because it's in the the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. It's it's really a great account, especially the uh, the bit of herb that they that they locate, um, which turns out to be unbelievably bitter, and they drink too much of the hard cider. Um, so. Um, but you've given us, I think, this wonderful tapestry of ways in which the Jews experienced military service. Um, and uh, I know you have uh, additional imagery here. Yeah. <laughs> so th that is, is a more um, humorous right, uh, account, and I think uh, is worth letting us get some sense of sort of the the diversity of these experiences and and how uh, how we have some knowledge of them which i think is important because for a long time we really didn't know much about it absolutely so, so so this this image really speaks to to again one of these challenges of, of being a, a jew with within the ranks that the uh the in an army marches on its stomach in the famous adage and, and the union army mar uh, marches uh, or, or consumed a vast quantity of pork uh, that that uh, that you know, pork was an absolute a staple, um, and an assault pork and pork in every possible variation, and and commented on here in this cartoon submitted to a, a newspaper, uh, making and again there's there's no comment attached to it, but uh, no surprise that the newspaper picks up on this. This is that a Hebrew volunteer is identifying the ubiquity of of, of the pig uh, within the the military military diet. So so so. You know, certainly, there's you know, that challenge. Uh, likewise, the, the tremendous um, the shortage of, of food uh, as well, that, that soldiers perpetually you know, hungry and are foraging and, and eating whatever, whatever they can find. And, 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 but likewise, there are wonderful accounts of, of, of soldiers who are, you know, are desperate for the, the, the trunks, the boxes sent from home with, uh, with gericht and with, with delights from, uh, from, from family. Uh, that that all sorts of you know, the taste of home, uh, while uh, while um, you know subsisting off this this diet, this monotonous diet of pork and hardtack and, and other such things. So again, there's a lovely uh, account by Marcus Spiegel, who's 
mentioned earlier of of him writing to his wife, urging him, urging her to, to send uh, food uh, and and very particular things that he requests, and lots of alcohol and, and otherwise. And one of the things that she sends uh, is is duck tongue. I didn't know that this was a, a delicacy, pickled duck tongue. And he, just, he writes this wonderful letter back saying how uh, how so how he so enjoyed on the march eating this pickled duck tongue. Uh, so, so, um, uh, so, so certainly there are ways, these interesting strategies which, which soldiers and you know, Jewish soldiers adapt to, to make the, 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 their military experience uh, that much more, much, much easier, more pleasant. When likewise, a request for Jewish soldiers, we have examples of requesting uh, that prayer books be sent and other uh, you know, Jewish ritual objects be sent as they gain in these moments, for example, outside Petersburg, the siege of Petersburg, which is a moment where you have a concentration of, of Union troops in one place, and and, there's, and war becomes static, that, that people know where they're going to be uh, for, for a, a period of time, that there is opportunity here for, for Jews to band together, and to try and, and, and worship together, uh, but otherwise, which is, which is difficult or impossible uh, for, for a Union soldier. So you mentioned Spiegel, and um, it was mentioned before as well. Can you say a little bit about Jewish leadership? Absolutely. So, so Spiegel is the, the real, the inverse of the, um, some of the less reputable figures we, I showed you images of, of, of earlier. Uh, I, I don't know if I, in fact, on the cover, uh, no, so this is, my, this is not Spiegel here. Um, so, um, well, that's the, we'll talk absolutely, about, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll talk about uh, from the past moment. So, um, so Spiegel is again an immigrant, um, lands up in a, a rural town in, in Ohio. Um, he marries a, 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 a Quaker, um, Carolyn. And what's wonderful about, uh, about his wartime uh, record um, is uh, that um, we have uh, this, this extraordinary correspondence uh, which lasts for years, uh, but uh, we have uh, his letters to, to, uh, to, to her. And they're extraordinarily honest, open, revealing letters. Um, you can really hear, even though they're his letters, you can hear her responses in them as well. That, that, that her heart, uh, her angst, her, her tremendous sadness at his, his absence. And, and he's someone who initially enlists, he's looking for what's described as a bomb proof job. He's, uh, Ohio has what are called stay laws. And he had had the misfortune of uh, just before the war, of investing very heavily in property, trying to establish his business in Millersburg, Ohio. His timing is bad. He has very substantial debts. The war disrupts business. And, and he wants to take advantage of these stay laws. He wants to, to, um, to keep his, his, his business intact. Stay laws basically mean that if you enlist, uh, bankruptcy uh, proceedings cannot move forward against you. So it so buys, him, buys him time. And he wants a bomb-proof job. He wants a, a job which will, which will save him from, from, from danger. He, he thinks he, he might want to be a quartermaster or, or something which is, which, which is safe. And, and he's very open about this uh, as well uh, in, in these letters to, to, to his wife. Uh, but then he discovers uh, that he has uh, both a, an ability when it comes to, to, to command and, uh, and, and, he, he, uh, and, and also um, uh, a sense of increasing commitment to his position as well. That, that, and, and we see this change over time that initially he writes about how he, he, he wants the, the, the money that he's, he's in it for, for both the, the, the protection from bankruptcy proceedings, but also the, the income that, that a, a steady employment will provide. This shifts over time instead to a commitment to the cause and commitment to his men and, and real demonstration of acumen on the battlefield. Um, so, so the, the tone will change over time within these letters, and and eventually he, he says to his wife, effectively, he, he cannot leave his position. He's now he rises in effect to command his um, his regiment, um, and commands his regiment in tremendously difficult circumstances in in Mississippi, um, and that he cannot leave because he he is dedicated to 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 the cause and to uh, to his men. And his political views likewise undergo this tremendous transformation during the war. That someone who, who, who writes the most very terrible things about Lincoln and abolitionism and, and uh, really responds in a very hostile way 
to the Emancipation Proclamation, someone who, who then changes his thinking completely, uh, effectively comes to think of himself as a crusader to, to free the slaves and to, to, to punish the South for slavery as well. So again, this very human uh, response and real ability in his case when it comes to, to leadership. Yeah, his transformation is really fascinating because it, it shows you just what the experience of military service could actually do for a particular individual and one assumes also for uh, some others as well. Um, as you know, uh, there was not that much enthusiasm for Lincoln uh, among many Jews, um, which was shared depending on where they lived with their fellow New Yorkers or whatever, right? Um, didn't really care, care for him. But as the war progresses, there are changes, certainly in attitudes towards uh, slavery and all. You have one example, I know we have in the slide, of a photographer, a Jewish photographer. And you'll forgive me if I ask <laughs> you to show that because I am interested in photography, which was a relatively new um, technology at, at the time. And, and we do know that Matthew Brady's Civil War photographs have been enormously influential. So can you tell us a little bit about this Jewish photographer? Absolutely. So this is, this is Philip Haas, the photographs of two of the, the, the photographs taken by, by, by Philip Haas. And, and, and they're taken at a very significant place uh, that those of you who have seen the movie Glory uh, will, will uh, be able to place this as well. This is, uh, this is outside uh, Charleston. This is close to uh, Fort uh, Wagner. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the, the image on, on my left, on your right, is this is the blockading squadron out, again of US Navy ships outside uh, Charleston as well. You can see again this density of the blockading uh, squadron. And, and this is an individual who has a professional training as a photographer. He's one of at least 10 uh, Jewish photographers uh, during, during the war. So, so I, I think a significant uh, number. Um, and again, I think there's, a, there's an interesting story here. We can speculate at least again, this attraction of, of Jews to, to new uh, artistic and scientific forms, perhaps in, uh, in a demonstrated by Philip Haas and, and by others. Uh, and some of the Jewish photographers are, are quite significant figures. There's a, there's a sort of photographic studio, the arrival to, 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 to Brady, uh, where, where um, again, um, uh, where, where it is, you know, clearly it's a profitable enterprise, but, but, but Jews are early adapters in, in terms of, of, of this art form. Um, and, um, but we have other cases, again, of, of Jews who are um, uh, doing as other photographers are doing as well, which is to, to um, uh, create portraits for, for soldiers who, who um, both for themselves and for their families, want to create a record of their of their military service to reassure their families by by sending portraits home. That photography is deeply, deeply meaningful uh, during the war, and as you've described, a novel technology as well. That this is this is uh, almost sort of magical technology for for, for for soldiers at the time, and particularly that this is a moment where it's becoming. A, a mass art form as well. That's something which is available to, to, to ordinary uh, uh, individuals um, and, and, and therefore gain this an interesting positioning of Jews at this moment where, where this, this new um, uh, form is, is taking off. So sort of to, to wrap up then, what would you like us all to, to take away from what you've, what you've done here in this wonderful book? So, so certainly, I mean, some of it has been suggested already by, by the earlier earlier speakers that, that, that this uh, the Chappelle roster, what it, what it allows us to do, and what it allowed me to do uh, with this uh, with this book as well, is to both hone in on these individuals and to give give life to them. That individuals who who um, Simon Wolf did uh, again a wonderful work and very important work at the time, but but often these are individuals we we don't have a sense of. Of, of their their actual experience, what does it mean to be a, a Jew in the Union Army at the time? So, so certainly, this is one of the things which which I've, I've sought to do in the book is give life to these otherwise, in most cases, forgotten and ordinary people confronted by these extraordinary times, extraordinary challenges, and the very human responses to it that really humanize them and to see their their, their evolution not always for better in, in in the army. So certainly, and that. I think the other thing which, which the Chappelle roster does, and I've tried to do in this book as well, 
is to, to use the, 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 the breadth of data that provides too, uh, that um, we have known, uh, we knew before the roster, uh, some of the variety in terms of where uh, um, Jews came from in the United States, uh, immigrants came from, that you know, maybe Bavarians and Jews from Hess and elsewhere. But what this, uh, the roster allows for is to establish patterns uh, which putting individuals together you know creating our own jewish regiments by putting them side by side allows us to to really understand broader patterns in jewish experience and to differentiate them likewise from from other ethnic and immigrant groups so this is a war where uh, around a quarter of the soldiers in the union army are, are immigrants um so, so it's, a, it's really a, a an army which reflects this american this act of becoming uh, at, at the time and, and to understand how Jews are, in many cases, similar in terms of their experience to other ethnic groups, but also is a distinctly Jewish story, which, which I think that the book tries to, to bring out here, that they're both in terms of the, the, the challenges of being a Jew and trying to uh, you know, follow Judaism in, in the army, but, but other patterns too, which, which, uh, which you wouldn't expect in terms of, of enlistment and then post-war experience, which, which sets Jews apart. So, so to trying to, trying to both, in a, in a way, recover the individual experience, but also to see Jews as, as having a distinct, broader experience at this critical moment in, in American history as well. So thank you very much. Um, we have some time, I think, for questions. Um, and so if you raise your hand, um, there's a mic that people can see. Yeah. We'll also send um, Adrian de Armas. We'll go back up as well if you have questions about the roster in addition to questions about the book. Mm -hmm. And I'll come around with the, uh, with the microphone and try to keep questions relatively brief. Um, Professor uh, Faust, about 15 years ago, wrote a book called The Republic of Suffering and describes the tremendous transformative impact of the Civil War on America itself. How would you describe the impact of the Civil War on the Jews at the time? I could have asked for a, a, a better question. It's really a wonderful question to lead off on. Um, and uh, I, I, I devote a whole chapter to this. So, so actually, it wasn't, wasn't a plant. So I'll, I'll thank you, pay you later. Um, so, so, um, so I devote a whole chapter to this. And this is one of the, again, uh, areas where, where I hope I've said something new and interesting uh, in, in the book as well. And, and I make two arguments around this. One is I think that the, what we haven't sufficiently appreciated is how wartime anti-Semitism uh, will, will shape post-war Jewry as well. That, uh, that, that Naomi Cohen made a, an, an argument many, many years ago saying that the war um, had a significant impact, an anti-Semitism war had a significant impact, but it wasn't picked up by, by other scholars. And I think that, that she was onto something very important um, that, I, I trace, or at least I make the argument that what we regard as modern anti-Semitism, or many, well, at least a significant number of its features are rooted in, in all the uncertainties of, of wartime, that wartime unleashes, unleashes a, a Pandora's box uh, uh, of, of uh, ill feeling, not just towards Jews, but towards other groups as well. And, and, and it has this lasting legacy, uh, which we see in fact in Simon Wolf's work, I think is, is in a way, responding to, to many of these forces unleashed by the war. That's one area where I think the war has a very significant legacy. And the other argument, which, which I'm, I gain, it's, it's somewhat speculative in the, in the book, but I, I think there is something to it, is that before the war, we have a, a, an American, um, you have uh, Jews in America who come from a variety of different backgrounds, a very diverse Jewish population. They come from, uh, many of them from Central Europe, but also from a whole variety of other places, from Central Eastern Europe, from the Caribbean and elsewhere. And they bring with them, I think, quite distinct identities uh, from the places that they come from. And I, and I make the argument that I think that during wartime, we see a coalescence of a sense of American Jewishness. That because, again, partly because of anti-Semitism, partly for other reasons, uh, partly because it, it does the same thing for other immigrant groups after the war, so that a sense of Germanness is creating the war, a sense of Irishness is creating the war, again, because the American public is, is identifying Germans and Irish and often in negative ways. I think the same thing happens for Jews, that it creates a sense of, of American Jewishness, that we need American Jewish institutions to represent us. We, we, need, we have common interests, not as Bavarians or Hessians or, or people from, from Eastern Europe, etc. but we, we, have, we have common interests as American Jews. 
and we see a, 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 an explosion after the war of, of efforts to create new institutions, which I think comes out of both of these impulses, both of the, the, the rise of, of this very troubling anti-Semitism and the sense that we, we have this common interest as American Jews. So, so that's, that will be my, my, my argument. But I think there are many other consequences of the war too, but those two to me are, are, are underappreciated. Uh, we have become knowledgeable about the contributions of American Jews during World Wars I and II, and now with the Chappelle roster, the Civil War. My question is, and I don't know whether you or Professor Sarna may know the answer or Professor Moore, is there anything equivalent to the Jewish contribution to the Spanish-American War, the War of 1812, and the American War for Independence? Were there any Jews going up San Juan Hill with Teddy? Yes, there were. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, there were um, Jews going up San Juan Hill with, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, what's interesting about the Spanish-American War is that Jews who enlisted in like the, the Rough Riders um, had long memories um, about Spain. And this was going to be a way sort of to get back at Spain for 1492 when Jews were expelled from Spain, which is, it's really interesting to recognize that this was in Jewish consciousness. Now, obviously that's not relevant for something like the Civil War, or the War of 1812. But for the Spanish-American War, there was a real anti-Spanish um, animus among Jews. I think we'll, just to add to that, I think that, that um, uh, certainly, I mean, there's very good scholarship, and thanks to, to, to uh, in large part yourself, about the Second World War, and likewise, very you know, good work now on the First World War. But, but these other conflicts are, are calling out for reappraisal. I think that, again, mm -hmm. revisiting uh, the, the complexities of the War of Independence uh, and, and later wars too, that, that, uh, that, that you know, again, um, not that I, I'm making any suggestions what Benjamin Chappelle should focus on next, but <laughs> <laughs> these are, these are again, we, we don't know. And, and again, part of Simon Wolf's project originally was to record the names of, of Jews who, who, had, who had fought in, in the War of Independence and Spanish Americans, so, uh, Spanish American War, etc. that, that um, I know that someone is looking into uh, Wolf's accounting of the Revolutionary War. Um, soldiers, uh, she's uh, look, uh, doing work uh, both <clears throat> through the DAR and because I had assumed that that list was fairly, fairly solid. And she said, no, 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 uh, there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done in that. And that's helpful to us because of uh, the tradition of military service in families. And so that means that we can find additional um, people who are descendants of Revolutionary War soldiers uh, who were serving in the Civil War. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, do you ever mention anything about the development of the KKK and the Burning Cross in the Confederacy? Um, when when that foundation started uh, and and it does still exist today with some of these Trump you know extremists is that or do you know when that started? Um, so, so certainly, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a, um, a topic which attracted uh, very good scholarship, uh, looking at at the the the, um, the post war environment. In fact, some of the most recent work argues that the war really doesn't end. That there's a uh, that it, it continues in the guise of not just the KKK, but a variety of, of other, uh, other uh, very, very violent movements, often uh, promoted by and, and involving Confederate officers and, and, and soldiers who, who, who um, will, will uh, continue a, a reign of violence, uh, you know, certainly un, until the end of Reconstruction, but beyond uh, as well. And, and there's a debate, in fact, it's something I'm now working on, on a book about the Jews in the Confederacy, about um, does it necessarily involve, as the KKK goes through a variety of evolutions, uh, different forms, there's a post-war form, and then there's a, 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 a rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan uh, really after the First World War, and then a, a third coming, 
uh, during uh, the, the civil rights uh, movement. Um, but during this first phase, uh, is there necessarily a, an anti-Semitic element to it, which we certainly see um, in the 1920s, and we certainly see in the 1950s and 1960s. And, and, we, and again, there are some episodes uh, which, which, do, which do suggest that, that uh, Jews are targeted, um, where well, you know, lynching as part of this extraordinary lawlessness and, and violence, uh, most of it, the, the overwhelming majority directed at, at African Americans after, after the war. But in some cases, Jews are involved in Republican politics um, in, in, again, the, the period after 1865, which is a dangerous thing to, to, to do in, in some places. But likewise, you have Jews involved in, in democratic politics, in other words, at the time, which, which means not necessarily openly supporting the, the, in these short, these, these violent movements, but, but certainly wanting a return to, to a, um, some of the, the pre-war norms, uh, you know, African-Americans knowing their place, uh, a, 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 a creation of a, of a racial hierarchy, a recreation of racial hierarchy in society. So we see again, complicated Jewish behavior, and, 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 uh, but, but certainly the, the sort of anti-Semitism we see later, um, if it is present in the post-war, post-Civil War period, it's, it's much more muted than it will become uh, in, when the Ku Klux Klan returns uh, or was reborn in the 1920s and then afterwards. Yes, um, up until the Spanish-American War, most wars were fought by volunteer armies. What has the universal draft? Um, we know what it has done with Black Americans and you know, at least the post First World War, uh, perhaps at least the Second World War, but what has been the effect of the universal draft? So <clears throat> when you had a, um, a universal draft, Jews were fortunate enough not to be singled out. Right? They did not enter a segregated military the way Black Americans did. And they were integrated throughout all of the different um, categories, military categories, whether it was the Air Corps or the Marines, or the, the, um, the Army, Navy, etc. And that meant for most Jews, um, their experience was um, not to be in large, in units which had many Jews. Now, it, it varies a great deal. Um, in the First World War, there's recruitment of New Yorkers. They go to Camp Yatank, and there are Jews uh, at officer level all the way down through the ranks. And that's an, an unusual situation. In the Second World War, you don't have that um, as much, uh, but you do have a lot of recognition on the part of the military of the importance of trying to figure out how to get Catholics and Protestants and Jews to fight together uh, and how to build respect. Um, those categories did not include Black Americans. Um, and it's only after Truman desegregates the military that you begin to get efforts to figure out how to integrate Black Americans and also other uh, religious movements like Buddhists, for example, um, who are, are present in the Korean War where it becomes an, an important issue. Since there are Buddhists on the other side, and you know, so the issues of, of religion uh, intersect with those of um, ethnicity, and when you have for the period when you have a universal draft, which is a relatively short period of time, um, the military works sometimes successfully and sometimes a little less successfully to try to create a notion of an American soldier that encompasses a wide variety of types of people after World War II. I'd like you to discuss one of the most influential people in America after the Civil War, and that, uh, that was Mark Twain. 
he made a speech at Carnegie Hall and he also wrote a, an article about concerning the Jews where he spoke out and said that the Jews were not represented proportionally in the military. And then he recanted that and he was, he was pro-Jewish his whole life. And he's the guy who published Grant's memoirs where he had to deal with, uh, with uh, General Order Number 11. So how important was he in the attitude toward the Jews by the American public? So I think the best answer to this is, is it's forthcoming uh, that there's a, a project, Chappelle Manuscript Foundation project, again, a, a, a Jonathan Sarno working with Benjamin Chappelle to, to, to write a, a proper history of the, the relationship between Twain and, and, and the Jews. Uh, so, and, and I think it will add, I mean, it's, you know, I write in, in this book a little bit about about exactly that episode which you described, that, that the the um, the article written by by, by Twain, which which seemingly is is is, is critical about about Jews, and I but I I um I'd, I'd say wait a few years and we'll probably have a far richer context to understand that that episode, and and uh, you know um, uh, come back. I don't know what the deadline is, but come back. You know, here I'll be in the audience. I, you know, Jonathan Benjamin will be on the stage, and we'll find out more. Um, <laughs> Couple last questions, or uh, oh, was that last question? One last question. <laughs> sure. Let's take one last question. Then. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, I was interested in the part that where there was this one regiment from Syracuse, which had a significant minority but the population of jewish soldiers the rest were interstitial one or two per regiment and that i thought and this is based totally on anecdotal information my own experience um that's common in all of our wars that the jews are not grouped uh, into jewish groups i was on a destroyer escort from 1965 to 67 anti-submarine warfare officer. I had one other, there were 165 men on the boat. There was one other Jew and me. And we had a Christian chaplain who really wanted to lead services for us because alcohol is forbidden on United States naval vessels. And he had that sacramental wine that he wanted <laughs> to drink with us. <laughs> and my experiences were all of the different types that you would, some people welcome me, because of my Jewishness and others. Um, well, actually what happened, I was serving during the time when the, the Six Day War, where one of our, um, one of the Israeli, the Israelis shot up a, a, a spy ship off the coast. And then, yeah, and then there were people who tried to pick on me for that. So it, all variety of experiences. I appreciated your talk very much. Just a, a word in response. Your, your point is a very good one. What makes, I think, the Civil War then distinct and different from, from other, other wars is that, um, that the, the, the ethnic regiment is, is, is common during, during the war, uh, that um, there, there, there is a, a German corps uh, during you know, the, the 11th Corps. Is, is, it's not exclusively German, but certainly there are identifiable Jewish, identifiable ethnic uh, um, units. And, and this is deliberate, that this again speaks to themes which we discussed earlier, that, that uh, Lincoln um, makes a, a, an effort to, to accommodate, um, yes, Jewish soldiers, but, but a, a very significant effort to, to, to make the, you know, the quarter of immigrants in the army feel welcome and, and accepted. And one of the, again, interesting distinctions, differences between Jews and, and um, other ethnic soldiers, not just that, that Jews are, are much more likely to be isolated than the German soldiers are likely to serve alongside other German soldiers, Irish like, like, uh, you know, likely to serve alongside uh, other um, uh, Irish uh, soldiers. So, so, so there's, uh, there's, there's that difference, but also, I, again, this topic which is likely to be controversial, something which I, I, I deal with, with in the book as well, that, that at least initially in the war, I think Jews are more ambivalent uh, than some other ethnic groups. We see ethnic champions within the German community and Irish community who then often go on to become generals, et cetera. And, and Jews for a variety of reasons, partly because of that, that anti-Semitism I talked about earlier, right from the start of the war, 
have a more complicated uh, uh, relationship with the water. It's partly again because they're Jews in the South and there's concern about again the division within American Jewish uh, life and community. Uh, but that there's a difference which which we we see more of at least initially amongst Jews. Later, other ethnic communities will share that. But we see Germans and Irish feel much like Jews from 1863 onwards. That they also um, are deeply troubled by anti-Irish and anti-German sentiment. But that comes later for a variety of reasons here in the world. We are thoroughly out of time, but I'd like <laughs> us to thank thank all of our panelists. <laughs> Professor Dashmore, Professor Sarna, uh, Professor Mendelssohn, and, um, and Ms. Diarmas. Uh, I'd like to also invite you to come out into our reception uh, in the Great Hall where we will have the books for sale and Professor Mendelssohn will be signing and you can ask your additional questions there. Thank you. Thank you very much.